So thank you, thank you very much. Um, and now I would like to invite our next speaker, who is Dr. Daniel King. Uh, Dr. King works as a lecturer in Syriac literature at the University of Cardiff. Among his research interests are the development of Greek and Syriac Christian doctrines in the fourth to seventh centuries, as well as the reception and transformation of Greek philosophical and scientific culture in Syriac. The works of Dr. King have made a significant contribution to the reception of Greek philosophy in the Syriac world. This has been achieved by various scholarly works. And one could mention uh, his two monographs. The first one is um, titled The Earliest Translation of Aristotle's Categories in Syriac. And another book, uh, The Syriac Versions of the Writings of Cyril of Alexandria. In addition to these, in addition to these two books, he has also edited three other books and published at least five book translations from Syriac, Ancient Greek, and Hebrew. Hence, uh, we are extremely privileged to have uh, uh, Dr. Daniel King with us today, and I invite him to present his talk. Okay, that, 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 thanks very much, Dennis. Um, can you hear me okay? I'm not sure how good my internet, internet connection is. Yes, well, we can hear you very clearly. Okay, if it gets a problem, just wave at me and I'll try to <laughs> improve it. I have two different networks, so I could change between them if this one is no good. Um, yeah, thanks very much for the, for, for the invite. Um, I've got um, an, a few ideas just to share with you uh, on, 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 well, this subject of comparative philosophy. So when, when, uh, when this was mentioned, it occurred to me that I could speak for a few minutes about a particular text that has interested me recently. So instead of talking very generally about the whole uh, area of Syriac philosophy or the Greek Syriac um, divide in philosophy, I thought I'd just share with you some... Uh, some observations of one particular uh, text, and uh, and we'll see where, where where that gets us. It might be of interest to some of you, and I'll show you um, some passages from it in just a minute, if my screen share uh, works okay. The text in question was written by um, a philosopher called Jacob of Edessa, um, and so what I'll do, I'll just very briefly explain who who this man is, and 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 then go through the text a little bit and briefly we'll summarize it and what it's about and, and, and at the end try to draw together why it's, why it's interesting or why it's uh, a significant text for us. Um, so firstly the who, this is um, Jacob of Edessa, we're, we're talking about the 7th century, the second half of the 7th century in, uh, in the area that's nowadays Syria. Um, we're talking about a man who was uh, a scholarly monk and uh, eventually bishop, a very senior ecclesiastic within the Syriac community in the second half of the seventh century. Uh, we're talking about a guy who was highly educated in Greek as well as in Syriac, and read and read extensively in both languages, and who contributed to uh, to Syriac literature in a variety of ways, not just as a philosopher, but primarily we could say as a translator. Uh, he translated some Aristotle, he also translated some of the Greek church fathers uh, and also contributed to the translation of the Bible itself into Syriac. So he had many different interests. He was a philologist and a linguist who wrote a grammar, he wrote the first technical grammar of Syriac. Um, and he had a great concern for standardizing um, the Syriac language, especially its written form. Uh, and scribal practices in the way that manuscripts were produced. So he had a range of, uh, of interests and concerns. But he was also, above all, a, a pastor and a church leader who lived at the time when, um, when Islam was first becoming a serious issue in, in, uh, in, in Syria and the community, communities over which he presided were mixed Muslim and Christian. And this was bringing a lot of issues between different, different, di different uh, parts of the communities in which he lived. And so there were a lot of very real life issues that he has to, to deal with. So we're not just talking about an ivory tower scholar here, but somebody who is very much involved um, in the daily life of, of his people. And the text we're talking about is, it's entitled the Handbook of Logic, um, though it's really much more specific than, than that title would suggest. It's got quite a specific remit. And that remit is to discuss the definitions of a number of terms that are commonly used in metaphysics 
uh, and especially in ontology, terms that we've seen already a few times today, such as nature and being uh, and substance and existence. And his main goal and concern is to try to explain to a Syriac speaking readership what the usage uh, of the Syriac terminology within the semantic field ought to be and how the Syriac terms relate to their Greek counterparts, which is often not in a, in a simple one-to-one -one correspondence. So to put it in brief, his concern is to try to explain how certain Syriac words relate to certain Greek words and what the, what the semantic ranges of these different words could be in different contexts. And that leads to his other big goal here, which is to explain to his readers how these terms, nature being substance and existence, are used differently if you are reading uh, pagan philosophy, Greek, the Greek philosophical tradition, or if you are reading Christian theology. And he makes this clear distinction between two sets of authorities, the, the, the pagan philosophers, Aristotle and the commentators on the one hand, and the, the church fathers, the, um, the, the, the theologians, the, the revered theologians of the Syriac tradition, on the other hand, and he is at pains to show his readers that these two groups can use the same words in different ways. Um, and that therefore, when you're reading two different types of discourses, you've got to, as it were, put different hats on and understand them in different ways. So that, that, that's, if you like, his big, um, his big goal. Um, I'll show you some examples now. Um, so for example, he began, begins his, with a discussion of nature as fusis uh, in, in Greek, um, which he begins by examining, well, he starts off by examining the historical semantics of it. So he'll go into the detail of what the Greek word means etymologically, uh, how it came to mean, what it does mean in, uh, in, in Aristotle. And then he'll do the same for the Syriac um, equivalent word, we could say. Um, and again, he tries to explain the background of that and how it comes to mean something a little bit different to the ordinary Syriac speaker. And having done that, he'll, he offers a bunch of definitions. And if I can just share my screen successfully, I will, um, I will do that. There's that coming up. Yes, we see it. Okay, so <clears throat> there what we've got is a bunch of definitions that he offers for, uh, for the term nature. And the interesting thing about these, uh, we, I won't go through all of these in, in, in detail, read all of them at all. But the interesting thing about them is that the first six of these are taken from uh, Aristotle's Metaphysics, book Delta, um, which is a text that was ever translated into Syriac, so far as we know, and Jacob is certainly depending on the Greek text itself, which, with which he was no doubt familiar, or perhaps on, um, on, on extracts or a compendium of some sort. But he lifts from book Delta of the Metaphysics these first six definitions of nature, which Aristotle had given. Um, and then after that, after those first six, he adds further definitions of his own, um, which bring this definition of nature towards something more useful as a metaphysical tool. And it, it, the, the, these definitions are beginning to bring him towards a position that has been described as ontological particularism. That is, Jacob is seeing nature, the nature within an item as being constituted of that item, it's not just the equivalent of a substance universal, but as a particular nature inherent in an individual substance. Um, and you could begin to see that, for example, in definition number seven here, that I'm highlighting nature as a thing's constitutive faculty. Um, or again, in uh, number eight here, nature is the faculty that is found firmly fixed within something which permanently has within itself an actuality that constitutes itself or its being. Um, if you look down here at number 11, he's sort of progressing, he seems to be progressing through a series of definitions towards what he wants to say about it. Uh, the nature is that substance that is in a thing's constitution, or even to the end, nature is a thing's self-subsistence. Uh, self he's moving towards a position that defines nature as something that is uh, inherent in each, in each substance and is particular to it, rather than simply as being the equivalent of, um, of a substance universal. And I'll, if I have time at the end, I'll just try and explain why that's, why he's doing that, why that, um, why that's significant. So after 
talking about um, nature in this way, he moves on to talking about substance or being, however you want to translate it, the Greek usia. Uh, and again, he begins his treatment by offering a quite a sophisticated discussion of the translation of translation method and of translation history. Because again, what he has to do is to explain to his readers what the different Greek terms are within this semantic field. So he has to explain, without using Greek itself, the difference between toon uh, or hoon or toenai or usia or words like hopachein and hopaxis as well. And he has to try and explain what all these terms mean, uh, how they are similar and how they differ. And then how these correspond to different Syriac terms that his readers may have encountered in the texts that they have read. And such texts would include Aristotelian commentaries, but also more likely theological treatises in which these terms crop up in the context of Christology or Trinitarian theology. And, and, and so Jacob's goal is again, um, to try to bring some clarity to what will be for a Syriac speaker at least, if not for a Greek speaker as well, a very confusing situation. And he does that by looking at translation, how translation works, and the translation history of certain, of certain terms. Um, he then goes on to offer the definitions again. So uh, having, as it were, discussed the translation history of this word, he wants to offer some actual definitions of what substance, usia, means. And if I just scroll down here, we'll find those. So again, there are 12 of them. And this time again, he's doing a similar thing that is he's lifting the first few from Aristotle. In this case, it's the first four. Um, any readers familiar with the categories of Aristotle will recognize some of these first four definitions. Um, for example, he says that substance is that which is neither applied to a subject nor in a subject. Um, or if you look at the, uh, the third one, substance is that which, while being self-subsistent, is not said to be either more or less what it is. Uh, and this is the, the, these are definitions list, lifted from Aristotle's categories, um, which speak very much to the notion of substance as being a way of referring to concrete individuals, the basic data of metaphysical analysis. So John is a substance, Peter is a substance. These are the essential um, items of metaphysical analysis according to this interpretation. Um, now, he doesn't expressly reject these definitions, and in a certain way, he says this is indeed what substance is. And, 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 and when you read an Aristotelian commentator, this is what they mean by usia. Um, but then he moves on to another group of definitions, which is more based around the idea of substance universals. And, in, um, well, we can look at some examples of those, even if you start at number five. Um, here you'll see it says substance is what is predicated universally and properly. So here we're talking about substance as being the things that are actually themselves uh, predicated. Substance is that which contains many subsistence while being just the same thing in relation to each of them and so forth. So these definitions, which um, although he says they come from Greek philosophical sources, we haven't managed to find what sources those are yet. These not directly taken from Aristotle. Um, substance number seven says substance is that which um, while many self-subsistence are reckoned from it, that is many individuals or particulars are reckoned from it, yet it is itself, all of them, and what it is, that is totiesti, all of them are, so that its definition is given. So this is more like what a, a genus or a species is. So th these are substance universals that he's trying to describe in a variety of different ways. Uh, and in fact, towards the end, I won't get into the detail here, but he, he, substance is, is being itself of each individual. Or the existence or something like that and that, that with that he gets onto this word yata here which he then has a whole whole another chapter on trying to to define i won't go into that today but that that leads to yet more um complications um but here he's clearly trying to explain to his readers what substance or what usia is when it's used in the context of christian theology when severus of antioch and the great greek church fathers uh, who were often read in Syriac translation by many, um, by many of his readers. He, he's trying to explain what these words would mean in, 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 in that context and trying to bring some clarity to it. 
So without going into any more detail on the text itself, um, I'll just bring these things to a, um, to a close by trying to sum up what its significance, what, what's the meaning of all this stuff? Why is it important? What's, what's it really trying to do? Well, there's all, the thing to understand is that within the Syriac <coughs> world in the 7th century, there's a whole load of dialectics uh, and oppositions going on. There's a struggle between different conceptions of Christian life and doctrine, between those who repudiate and those who embrace Greek philosophy and pagan education. Um, there are those holding to different doctrinal positions for a variety of different reasons, sometimes just historical reasons, sometimes philosophical reasons. And Greek philosophy and Greek theology are both being mediated into the Syriac world, principally by translators and commentators. And in a way, Jacob stands from above looking down uh, at this whole process as it's been going on for 150 years by his day, examining the process of translation and commentary uh, between Greek and Syriac as it's been practiced and analyzing it and trying to make sense of it. And as himself a practitioner of translation, he understands its power as well as its difficulty. He notes how the translator really is like a broker between the two different worlds, negotiating how that transference from Greek into Syriac is going to be realized. Um, his, his goal specifically, I think, in these, in these words is to, is to offer his readers uh, an ontological or metaphysical foundation upon which they can make sense of the Christian dogma that his own church would espouse, which is called myophysitism, that is the belief in the, sing in the single nature um, of, of, of the person of Christ. And philosophically nuanced myophysites such as Jacob himself would say that you can't have uninstantiated universals or natures. In other words, a nature must have some subsistence some subsisting entity that corresponds to it. And, and this is really entailed by a theory of ontological particulars, um, such as John Philopin has held to, and such as I think Jacob is probably moving towards in, 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 in this text, um, in this text today. In other words, he's offering The myophysites of his day, are, um, the, the watchword, if you like, of his of, of, of his community's dogma, which was the Christ in a single nature. For them, or for, 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 for the Byzantines, for the uh, imperial church in Constantinople, this looked like just a way to confuse two things that must be held apart. You've got divinity and humanity, and these are different natures, and to put them together into a single nature is simply a confusion of, of, of divinity and humanity, which would be the greatest crime um, a, a, a Christian could could commit. So for the, from the point of view of the Byzantine Imperial Church, what the Meafsites were doing amounted to, to worse than heresy, virtually paganism. Um, and yet from Jacob's point of view, and I think that of Philopinus as well, um, a nature is something rather different, something rather particular to each individual. And indeed you can't have a single individual who's two natures. This would be a contradiction of terms. And so that in, 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 in their way of thinking the person of Christ is a single nature. But I don't think Jacob meant that this is just about playing with words. I think one of the conclusions that uh, I draw from reading this, this admittedly difficult text, is that Jacob is at pains to try to show us that what we really need to do is to get beneath terminology and words to the actual concepts and ideas underlying them, that these doctrinal or dogmatic differences between different Christian groups is not just about words, it's about underlying fundamental ideas and concepts. And once we get to those concepts themselves and stop worrying just about the terminology itself, then we can we can sort out what's what. That, 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 I think that's his, um, his fundamental hope in writing this text. And the second one, as, as I mentioned earlier, is to try to sort out the theological from the philosophical. He absolutely wants his readers to grasp the significance of Greek philosophy and the importance of studying Aristotelian metaphysics and logic. If you're gonna start engaging in, 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 in complex, sophisticated discussions about the person of Christ, he really wants to put that foundation of Aristotelian metaphysics in place in order to make sense of the Christian theology. Um, and not to try to do the one without the other. And that's why he's trying to sort out these terminological issues and saying that what well, the doctors of the church mean it this way, but when you read Greek philosophy, 
um, it, it, it's meant in a different way. So I hope, <clears throat> I know that's been a very fast, maybe too fast um, whiz through what is, is a very difficult text that I'm still struggling through in many ways uh, myself, but I think and hope that it illustrates some of the bigger issues uh, going on within Syriac philosophy.